Hey, welcome to the King. This is a series that we're doing through the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter, to see what the Bible really has to say about the end of the world at the end times and all those incredible things that the Bible reveals to us. Today is going to be an exciting and fascinating look at one of the really key events in the entire book of Revelation, and that is the seventh trumpet that we see in Revelation chapter 11, verses 14 through 19. Hey, if you're just joining us, my name is Randy Bond. I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and we've been walking through this with our church family, and I'm glad to have you joining us today. If you're like a lot of people, uh, Revelation is very confusing, and you're trying to figure out how do all the pieces fit together. I know that's been my experience in the past, and once I finally kind of understood how Revelation, uh, the, the seventh trumpet of Revelation, plays such a vital key, that really unlocked a whole lot. And so here's what I think you're going to see today, as at the middle of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11 is right at that midpoint, is going to hold the clue for how the rest of all of Revelation fits together. And this is one of those uh, things that if you grab this, man, it really makes the difference. Uh, the middle seven, so remember there are seven series of judgment, or I'm sorry, three series of seven judgments, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. And that's, uh, that second set, the middle set, the seven trumpets, and particularly the seventh trumpet is really the key to unlocking so much. So uh, as we get in, uh, I, I think this is going to be an exciting study. And, and really the big question that we're going to be looking at is, is the seventh trumpet the last trumpet that we also see in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 15, and maybe even that one in Matthew chapter 24. Hey, if you're new with us, uh, I hope you'll uh, subscribe and follow more of the videos in their series, particularly if you like this. And if this gives you anything at all uh, to think about, uh, if it's kind of opened some new doors, some new um, uh, insight into scripture, I hope that you'll like this uh, and maybe share it. Now, I'm going to say at the beginning, this is going to be a little bit longer, so you might want to go ahead and click that uh, save to watch later and uh, maybe take a break, come back, because uh, there's a lot of content in here, but it's such an essential thing that I really struggle with, should I do this in multiple videos or one? But I think to really grab it, you need to have it all in one uh, setting. And so if you need to come back two or three times to finish this out, I hope you will, uh, because I think it'll be really, really helpful for you in the end. So just some reminders uh, about approaching uh, the book of Revelation and eschatology. Number one, we want to discern between Revelation, what is clearly revealed in Scripture as a whole, not just the book of Revelation, so note the little r on there, and speculation. Uh, oftentimes our minds want to fill in the, the gaps that are there, and there are intentional gaps that God has given us. He has not told us everything, but what He has told us is sufficient. And so we need to be careful about the speculative parts and making sure that there are clear lines of connection between the points of Scripture that we're trying to connect to make sure that this is what Scripture is really trying to say. Second, we want to discern between what Scripture says and what systems say. I know that there are a variety of different schools of thought about how to approach end times and the book of Revelation. And sometimes if we're not careful, those systems can color our approach to Scripture. They can be like filters. And so we want to be careful about reading through filters. Uh, this is a very subtle thing. We think we're reading it correctly, but we may be just reading it through uh, the, uh, the lens of a filter where we've already preloaded some ideas into what the Scripture means. And if we'll take the time to just really dissect the Scripture as it's plainly written, sometimes uh, that is going to be the, not sometimes, all the time, that's going to be the best approach. So uh, always, always, always be a Berean. I am absolutely confident that I'm going to say some things today that are either going to be new or uh, unsettling for you, uh, because this is not the approach that many people will take. Uh, but I, I think that this is more in line with what um, uh, Christians in the first, second century uh, may have understood. And I don't mean that as a proud statement. I do not understand everything about the book of Revelation. Um, and so if you disagree with me along the way, number one, I hope you don't just react and blow up the comments down below. But take that and really examine, is what I'm believing, meaning you as the listener, really correct? And how can I biblically defend that? Or is what he's saying correct and making sure that what I'm saying is really lining up, even if it's not lining up with your preconceived thoughts? Uh, so uh, let's dive in, and it's going to be a deep dive, but here we go into Revelation chapter 11, verses 14 through 19. First thing that we encounter is that as uh, we've had this interlude now come to an end, 
between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, we have these two visions, one of the mighty angel and the little scroll where John has to eat the scroll. And there's very significant things that we're going to come back to on that. And then we have the measuring of the temple and uh, the two witnesses. Uh, I have uh, a link to those if you did not catch those yet. Uh, but here is what we see as kind of the final statement now transitioning into the seventh trumpet. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. So just by way of review, we need to go back to Revelation chapter 8 because it's during the uh, the, the uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets that we're going to see this row. So between the, uh, this, these woes, so between the fourth and the fifth trumpet, here is what scripture records in Revelation. Um, then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So here's this warning that there are going to be three additional woes. Now, woe is not a word that we use a whole lot now, but this is the Merriam-Webster definition, and it means ruinous trouble. It means calamity. It means affliction. And what the eagle is warning is that what's about to happen is going to be incredibly intense and incredibly bad and that there will be pain and suffering and trouble that comes as a result of that on the unbelieving world. So the three woes, uh, when you're listening to them, and, and we'll catch that here in just a second, almost seem to function like a countdown clock. Uh, you hear the three woes being announced, but you're going to hear that eagle come in and announce that the, the, time is, the timer is ticking down. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at these three woes and the remaining uh, three trumpets here. Um, so the first woe is the fifth trumpet. And when that uh, trumpet blows, the abyss is open and there's this demonic locust army released and it, uh, it afflicts uh, those who are not sealed by God for five months. And again, I've got a link to that video on the, the first six trumpets uh, right there. Uh, once that is done, we hear the eagle say again, the first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Here is that countdown clock. Then we have the uh, second woe, which is the sixth trumpet. Uh, the four uh, angels at the Euphrates are released. There's this vast army uh, are also released. And their job, uh, what their task is to do is to kill one third of humanity. And when that one is done, this is where we get to that verse we started with. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Tick, tick, tick is what we're hearing in this. Um, in Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, here's the sad reality that we got at the end of the, the, the sixth trumpet, that even though these two woes had happened, even though these terrible things had come, it says that the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Basically, here's the indictment that the reason why the seventh and worst woe is about the seventh trumpet and the third woe, the worst woe is coming is because it's well-deserved. That even though God had given them those two warning shots, even though God had clearly demonstrated that he is real, that he is serious about sin, serious about judging, that they still would not relent and repent. And therefore, the third one is coming. So here is now the third and the worst woe, and that is the seventh trumpet. So let's take a look at the events of the seventh trumpet. And we're going to read through the scripture, and then we'll come back and, and summarize those. So starting in verse 15, it says that the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So here is kind of in a summary form, the sequence of, of events. So when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, 
just like with the uh, opening of the seventh seal, it's a multi-stage event where several things are happening. It's not just a singular event, but many things happening and are happening in that same way right here with the blowing of the seventh trumpet. We have number one, the announcement of the kingdom of God. Second, we have all of heaven worshiping. Third, we see the heavenly temple opened. And fourth, we see judgment and wrath being poured out. So let's uh, take a look at each of these uh, and, and grab some insight as we go, because this is significant in answering that question of, is the seventh trumpet the final trumpet? So verse 15, again, the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven and they're announcing the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So this is not a future tense, but it is saying here is the reality that's being actualized, realized right now. And so I think that this is announcing that final moment uh, with here that the kingdom of uh, the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ has now come. So the seventh uh, announcement is going to announce uh, that establishment of God's kingdom over the world. And so the theological implication is that this trumpet is signaling the, the final victory of Christ and the fulfillment of God's promises. The second thing that we happen as a result of that announcement is now this heavenly worship. Uh, we see uh, primarily the, uh, the 24 elders uh, at the, this announcement that goes forth, they fall on their faces and they begin to worship God. What they say in worship is significant. So uh, they acknowledge uh, his sovereignty and the fulfillment of his promises. So uh, we see that they give thanks to the Lord God Almighty. This is his sovereignty. This is that title uh, of the sovereignty of God. He is the Almighty God who is and who was the eternal God. And now they're saying you have taken, this is perfect tense, and you, uh, your great power, and you have begun to reign. Again, perfect tense, meaning an action that has taken place with lasting effects. And so this, is, again, is not a future statement that you will take your great power and you will begin to re reign later on in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. But this is saying this is happening now. And so they're going to also say the, the nation's rage, but your wrath came. And this is now beginning to speak of his judgment and his reward. So they're saying that the wrath came and also what came is the time for the dead to be judged. So here in chapter 11, we're getting announced what we will see in Revelation chapter 20, which is one of those clues about the close connection between the two. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. So the time for the dead to be judged, so the righteous dead, the rewarding of the servants, and he kind of broadly lists these categories of prophets and saints. So that's every believer in general. Everyone who has been saved and set apart is a saint. Um, and those who fear your name, another way of saying this, both small and great. So this is everybody. It's time for the rewarding of your right, the righteous ones, the righteous dead, uh, the, the, the followers of Jesus, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. This is speaking of the, the judgment on the unrighteous dead. So this seems to be pointing to that final judgment scene that we see in Revelation chapter 20. And here, just kind of as a quick summary of that, we only catch the unrighteous dead, I think, at this point. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Here is that judgment day scene that I think that the seventh trumpet is clearly announcing here as it's time. So just a, a quick note, I want you to watch for these uh, upcoming episodes where we'll talk in more detail about the two resurrections, the two judgments, and what the Bible really has to say about hell and lake of fire. All of those are in the queue. And so I hope that if you, if you haven't subscribed, this might be a good opportunity for you to do that and hit that notification bell. And by the way, if this is kind of helping you already, go ahead and give this a, a thumbs up. I won't mention that a whole lot more, I promise. Uh, so here, just quick summary. The seventh trumpet is announcing the arrival of God's kingdom, the, the arrival, it's here. Uh, God's wrath, it, it's here, and God's final judgment and the uh, and of the righteous and the unrighteous. It is basically saying, it's here, it's now. Now, after that comes the opening of God's temple. It's just this little snippet that we're given uh, here in this. It says that God's temple in heaven was open and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. So God's temple in heaven is open, the ark of the covenant is seen, and that's going to be accompanied by these catastrophic disasters, the, the, the uh, lightning and thunder uh, and the, the earthquake and the great hail. All of those are going to accompany this, that the, the heaven is open 
and these disasters come. So here's kind of the implication is that this is revealing the direct presence of God and involvement and, and the culmination of his covenant promises, that everything that he's promised about bringing a righteous end to the world and dealing with evil is being dealt with here and now. And that opening, and, and oftentimes we see the Ark of the Covenant being used as in the forefront of battle in the Old Testament. I think this is kind of the illusion here, that God is now doing battle with those that oppose him. And he is the one who is leading that battle. So, Moving now, let's compare the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bolt. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, and, and the question is, are these the same event? And we want to compare these because there's a whole lot of similarity, almost identical language. And that might help us to answer that question of, is the seventh trumpet the last trumpet? Uh, so let's take a look at the seventh trumpet that's on the left side here and the seventh bowl on the right side. So again, we saw in the seventh trumpet, that when the angel blows his trumpet, there's loud voices in heaven, and they're announcing the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. In the seventh bowl, there is a loud voice that comes out of the temple and from the throne saying, it is done. So we hear this loud voice coming from uh, the temple. And again, you see this emphasis here, uh, seventh uh, trumpet, it's within the temple, and the loud voice comes out of the temple, verse 17 of chapter 16. The next thing that we see is what happens as a result of that, the natural disasters, and I'll put natural in quotes because they have a supernatural origin, uh, but they are natural type of events uh, that are happening. Um, we see in the seventh trumpet that there were uh, flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hell. Verse 18 of Revelation 16, which is the seventh bowl, says that there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. And then we're going to get that description of the hail in verse 21. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on the people. That's 45 kilograms if you're watching in uh, the rest of the world. Um so this is a really identical language on the events that are that are happening here. So we see the symmetry of uh, this temple language, of, of uh, t the, the temple being open in heaven. And then we hear the same loud voice that's being announced there. And then we have the same events that are taking place. So here, I think, is where all the sevenths converge. The seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl of wrath. Uh, so we've already talked about those first two, uh, the events there. Looking down at the bottom one, the seventh seal, we see then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. We have that temple language yet again. So all three have that. And all three have this aspect of thunder, um, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So I think, and, and this is thus thinketh the Randy, not necessarily thus saith the Lord, that all three of these are pointing to one and the same event. This is where they all converge, uh, that all of these are landing on this same thing. And, and this helps us to better understand, number one, the book of Revelation is not written in a strictly chronological sense, but it also helps us to see the placement of where that seventh trumpet really lands, because all three of these signify a transition to the final act of God's judgment and wrath on evil, accompanied by devastating disasters on earth. It, 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 the description of these disasters makes us wonder, how could there be that repetition of the exact events the same way three different times uh, and, and still have people intact, uh, people still living? So I think one of the other clues happened in that interlude where we saw the mighty angel and the little scroll. Remember, who the angel is is not important. What the angel says is critically important. And this is what the angel says. And uh, this is uh, Revelation chapter 10, verses five through seven. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land uh, raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, that's a significant statement, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. No more delay at that seventh trumpet, this 
is, will all be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So I think that uh, this is just a, another one of those things that kind of points to that reality, that we're not looking at three different sevens that are going to happen sequentially, but that they are all one in the same event. Now, I could be wrong. And if you disagree with me, you can let me know in the comments. That's okay. I can take it uh, because I, I'm, I'm still kind of struggling and wrestling with the book of Revelation. It is a challenging book to understand. But if you see some glaring reasons why I might be wrong, I'd love to hear that. Uh, but if you, you know, think that this could be a possibility, you can let me know that too. So the broad outline of uh, chapters 15 through 20 also gives us a little bit better understanding. So if indeed the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl are the same thing, then we're looking at the seven bowls being revealed in chapters 15 and 16. Primarily in chapter 16 is where they are itemized out. Chapter 17 through 19 uh, verse 10 is about the rise and the fall of Babylon the Great. And this is a significant thing, and we'll come back to that in just a second. And then we see Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 2015 is the return of Jesus, uh, the battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign, the resurrections, plural, and judgment. And I misspelled judgment. Sorry about that. <laughs> now, go back here just a second. The seven bowls, in the seventh bowl, there is an additional thing that is mentioned there. And in Revelation chapter 16, verse 19, in the seventh bowl, this is also one of the things that's revealed, that the great city, this is speaking of Babylon the great, was split into three parts, and the, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Revelation 16 records clearly the demise the fall, the destruction of Babylon the Great. Revelation 17 through 19.10 is going to give us more backstory of the rise and the fall of Babylon the Great. And so we get a more detail in there, but the event is actually part of that seventh bowl. So if we simply take out that explanation and we're looking only at the clear connection, the sequence of events, then we are moving from the seven bowls to the return of Jesus. And that means that if the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl are all the same, all of these are opening up that door to the return of Jesus. Now, I don't mean a literal door. I mean that they're closely connected in the events and timing to Revelation chapter 19 and the events that follow. So that's kind of a significant piece in understanding how this all falls together. So let's take a look. Is this the last trumpet? So we want to connect. I keep saying that word so a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the last trumpet uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, and Matthew 24, 31. And these are going to give us some clues uh, as to whether or not this may or may not be that final one. So let's do a, a little scriptural comparison here among these three. So Matthew 24, 31, this is that first mention of it. It's, uh, this is Jesus speaking uh, in that Olivet Discourse where he's talking about the end of the world, what to expect that, uh, at that point. And he says uh, that he will send out his angels. This is Jesus talking about Jesus, that Jesus will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and will gather his elect from the four winds. Uh, so in the context of this, we see uh, verse 30 is the return of Jesus. So uh, we have this clear connection, trumpet call, return of Jesus. First Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with the cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Again, connecting the return of Jesus with the trumpet call. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. This is where we get that last trumpet terminology. Uh, and there, there's going to be some significant events that happen with that that we'll look at in just a second. All three of these are indicating the coming of Jesus will be signaled with the sound of a trumpet. Now, here's a comparison of these four passages, Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, and then if you can't see it behind my ugly mug, there's uh, Revelation 11 and really other parts of Revelation as well. Again, I'm thinking Revelation 11 is connected in time to Revelation 19 and 20. So this would follow out in sequence that way. 
So the first thing that we see, first event, is the trumpet sounding, Jesus descending. Uh, so in Matthew 24, we see that very clearly. In verse 31, we see Jesus descending. Actually, uh, in verse 30, 1 Thessalonians 4, we see that in verse uh, 16, 1 Corinthians 15. We see that in verse 52. And then we have that here in verse 15, the trumpet sounding. And then we see the return of Jesus clearly on earth at this point in Revelation chapter 19, 11 and following. The dead saints are raised uh, clearly in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verse 16, 1 uh, Corinthians 15, 52, and then Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. So you're looking at that blank spot under Matthew 24, and you're like, ha, see, that doesn't line up. Well, not necessarily. That may not necessarily be the point of what Jesus is trying to tell us, all the details in Matthew chapter 24. Do the dead saints get raised? Yes, absolutely. Does that happen at the time of his return? Yes, absolutely. So just because it is not specifically mentioned in a particular passage doesn't mean it's not going to happen or it's not happening in line with those things. Because what we also see is the living saints are changed, transformed, and gathered. Uh, so this is Matthew 24. Very clearly here in Matthew 24, the living saints, the elect, are gathered. Uh, that with the trumpet sound, Jesus sends out his angels to the four corners of the world to gather his elect. Uh, this seems to be the same thing that's happening in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, the same thing that we see in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. And here's, and this is where I may get some feedback. This is not necessarily explicitly stated in Revelation, at least not up until this point. We don't see the living saints uh, being gathered. Uh, I think Revelation 14, uh, where we see the Lamb of God on Mount Zion and the 144,000 gathered around him. That may be the first indication, the first preview of that event, but we really do not see a clear, explicit statement of the gathering of the living saints in the book of Revelation. Now, somebody's going to say Revelation 4. The, the people who typically say that will also say that we must interpret Revelation 4 literally. But you cannot get a literal rapture interpretation uh, as a literal interpretation from Revelation chapter 4. So I'll leave that there for another episode. Uh, you can blow up the comments if you want to now, but I, I, I don't know that I'll respond to a whole lot of those. Then we see the wrath on the unbelieving world. Now, again, notice the blanks on Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. Does that mean wrath's not going to happen? No. Uh, does that mean it's unconnected to these events? Absolutely not. Uh, Revelation 19, 11 and following. And again, verse 18 of Revelation 11, the chapter we're in right now. And then we finally see that, that death is overcome by victory. We get that in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verse 54. And then we're going to see that in Revelation 20, 14, uh, where death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. And then Revelation 24, uh, 21, 4 is that beautiful verse that says that God will wipe away every, uh, wipe away every tear and there will be no more death. Oh, Lord, hasten that day. Amen. Ah, look forward to that. So this may be uh, the first allusion, not clear statement, but an allusion to the rapture in the book of Revelation. Now, placing it here does not mean that this is a mid-trib kind of thing. Hear me clearly. The sequence of chronology seems to place the seventh trumpet near the end of the events of the book of Re Revelation. I'll say that again later. So let's talk about why I think, and again, this is thus think at the Randy, not necessarily thus say at the Lord, why I think that this may be the final trumpet. And I'm not 100% convinced. Uh, I could be wrong. And uh, this, this is where I'm leaning right now in my understanding. Uh, but this is not necessarily something that I would say dogmatically that this is absolutely it. And I don't know, I, I, and I would be careful about saying a lot of things dogmatically about the book of Revelation because there is a lot of figurative language. There are some very, very clear things. Don't hear me say it's all unclear. But I, I want to approach my understanding of the book of Revelation, number one, carefully, and number two, in light of what is clearly taught in the rest of Scripture. That's the key thing. So here's my reasons why. Number one, uh, and this is admittedly the weakest argument because it's kind of the argument from silence. Um, this is the last uh, trumpet that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now, some people would say, 
Well, Paul wrote about the, the, the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 uh, Corinthians 15. And at that point, John had not written uh, the book of Revelation. So how would they know about that? It, honestly, that does not matter. Uh, the fact that there's going to be a final trumpet is what Paul was clearly indicating. It doesn't mean that they had to know that in advance. They just needed to know that there would be a final trumpet. And as far as the book of Revelation reveals, this is it. There's no more mention of a trumpet after this one. Now, again, this is a weak argument, but there are others that are stronger. So hang with me. Number two, the seventh trumpet announce, announcements have a sense of finality about them. Uh, we see that God's kingdom has come. We see that God's wrath has come. And we see that judgment day has come. That these are all perfect tense, not future tense. That this is announcing what has, is taking place at the seventh trumpet. The natural disasters, this is my third reason, uh, are identical to the seventh seal and the seventh bowl, which place the events of the seventh trumpet at the return of Christ. So if these are the same as the seventh bowl, and the seventh bowl is closely connected to the return of Christ, then that would mean that the seventh trumpet is also put there as well chronologically. So to be clear, the revelation of the seventh trumpet in the middle of the book of Revelation does not mean that the seventh trumpet happens in the middle of the events of the book of Revelation. This is simply where we're told about it, but where it actually happens time-wise time -wise would be at the end of the book of Revelation, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, you can ask me and I'll try to clarify that a little bit more. I hope I've been clear enough. And number two, I'm not in any way indicating that this is a, a support for a mid-tribulation rapture position. Uh, again, I think the chronology of this puts this at the end, um, and so not in the middle, not before that great tribulation period, as some people would look at that. So let's look again carefully at the sequence of the gathering of the saints. So 1 Corinthians 4 on the left, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, no, I think I said 1, Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 4 on the left, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 52 on the right. Uh, so we see in verse 16, the Lord himself would ascend with the sound of the trumpet of God. And I think this is the same event here in 1 Corinthians 15, because what follows is what tells us these are the same. So it's at the last trumpet that in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, so this is a very rapid, instantaneous event that happens at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound, singular trumpet, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So here are the, uh, the events that connect these two event, events together. This is how we know we're talking about the same trumpet, and therefore it is right to call the First Thessalonians 4 trumpet the last trumpet also. We see in First Thessalonians 4, the dead in Christ will rise first. We see in First uh, Corinthians 15 that the trumpet sounds, and the dead, this is the first uh, thing that happens, the dead will be raised imperishable. And then the second thing is that then, then so se sequence here, uh, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them. And then 1 Corinthians 15 just simply says, we shall be changed. We will be transformed. Here's some good news, by the way, if this is new for you. If you are alive when Jesus returns, Jesus is not going to kill you and then resurrect you. Death is our enemy. <laughs> and so there will be an instantaneous change where you go from this mortal sin-filled body to the incorruptible, imperishable body forever. And that is awesome, awesome news. So these two events are clearly talking about the same thing. And there is a clear sequ sequence of, of the events. Number one, trumpet sounds. Number two, dead in Christ rise. And number three, we have the, uh, the living in Christ joining the dead in Christ that have already been raised. So according to scripture, there is no rapture of living Christians without the dead Christians being resurrected first. Let's just make sure we're very clear in our minds about this. Number two, there is no resurrection of Christians in the book of Revelation until the very end of the book, and it's Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And when the Christians, or at least a subset of them, but I think it's all the Christians that are being raised, very clearly, the Word of God says, this is the first resurrection. We don't see a second resurrection until the end of the millennium, 
And that seems to be the resurrection of the unrighteous dead. So the first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous dead, those who died in Christ. This is a clear mention of two resurrections, and the first one is a resurrection of believers. And folks, that doesn't happen until the very end. I, I don't think that there's any way to get around the timing of where Revelation 20 fits in the, the sequence of things, and that's where we see that first resurrection. Now, that might have you know, some head spinning and so forth, and so you might need to pause and kind of replay and take some of that in. Um, but let's look at this in comparison to what Jesus says about this. Uh, so again, back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Here's that last trumpet. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, we don't have that uh, explicit separating of the dead and the living, but all Christians will experience that, that gathering. And I think that's really the better word for that. So uh, we're not told that the, the specific dead in Christ rise first and then the living Christians join them. We're just simply told that every believer is gathered at this point. So this all happens at the return of Jesus, at that last trumpet call, and then we have the gathering of the saints. So when did Jesus say that this would happen? Well, we only need to back up one verse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. When you look at those descriptors there, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, that's trumpet four. Um, and the stars falling from heaven and the powers of heaven being shaken now uh, loosely on that second part, obviously, but trumpet five is the star falling from heaven. So this is kind of tied to the seven trumpets there. And we'll do another episode uh, coming up on are the seven trumpets and the seven bowls the same thing, or are they two different se sequences of events? And it'll be fun to explore that. So again, immediately after the tribulation of those days. These are the words of Jesus. And the tribulation of those days, he's already been talking about this. So uh, he, he says those days, he's referencing what he has already been discussing, what he's already been teaching. And in verse 21 is where we see that. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. There are only three times, three if you're in America, three if you're in Europe, um, only three times in the New Testament that great tribulation is mentioned, and all three are by Jesus, one here and twice in Revelation. And, and, and what we see is that Jesus is saying immediately after the great tribulation is when the Son of Man will come and the elect will be gathered. Hmm. So what does this mean? One, it helps us to hear the consistent call of the book of Revelation to endure. What I'm saying is that we need to be ready for general tribulation always. From the time that the, the that uh, Acts chapter 4, where tribulation began to break out against the apostles until now, Christians have always suffered for the faith. Christians will always suffer for the faith until the end. The only difference between general tri uh, tribulation and great tribulation is the intensity that it will be much, much more intense during that time. And so should we be alive when the Antichrist arises and when he begins to pour out that, uh, that trouble on uh, the people of God and conquer them and kill them, as Revelation 13, 7 indicates, we need to be ready to endure. And this is what we hear throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation 14, 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Just look at that word endurance in the book of Revelation. You see this is a repeated theme, a repeated theme throughout. And there is a promise of blessing to those who endure, who keep the faith, who stand strong in the faith, and who don't waffle in that or uh, renounce their faith or um, dilute their faith with uh, the pressures toward idolatry. All of these are significant statements in the book of Revelation, and that's the point of the book of Revelation, is to call us to be steadfast and faithful, no matter how hard it gets to be a believer. 
So revelation is a call to endure and to engage, not to escape and not to exceptionalism. Uh, it, what we see throughout the, the book of Revelation is a call to endure and a call to engage the world with the gospel of Jesus to the very end. And, and the, the great news of the book of Revelation is they cannot harm you even if they kill you. <laughs> that, that there is uh, the great hope for us that even though the time here is short and painful, that eternity awaits and it is worth it in the end. Second is that I think it helps us to see that Revelation is not written in a strictly chronological order. Uh, and so there are some things, and, and it, we've already looked at that uh, before, where the two witnesses are killed by the Antichrist, but the Antichrist is not mentioned until two chapters later. So there are things that happen kind of out of sequence, but they're setting up uh, the things that are to come. And, and that helps us in our reading of the book of Revelation. Well, hey, I, I want to say thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, if this was helpful in any way, uh, if it gave you something to think about, challenged you in any way, uh, I hope you'll subscribe and, uh, and give it a like. Uh, that really is the greatest compliment you can pay. And I, I deeply and humbly appreciate that. It means a lot. But if you do have some questions and comments, just leave those down below. And I do try to answer all the, the, the real questions that are there um, and, and try to respond to you as much as I can. Hey, thanks for watching. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time as we continue on with our series, Return of the King. God bless. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.